Hello, everyone. So today we're going to talk about nourishing hope for autism or all the important ways that diet and nutrition play a role in the health of your, chi your child and your children. So today I really want to emphasize the importance of how food matters for autism. We hear so much about diet, but sometimes it's I think really helpful to understand why diet helps, what it is about nutrition, what's important, and what you can know and do as parents. Because you're really on the front line, you're the ones that feed your child every day, you're the ones that see the changes and the differences diet can make. And so I wanted to do my best today to help you come up with some things that you can do and you can take away right when you leave from the conference, some things that uh, you can make changes to and start with. So I wanted to get an idea before we get started. How many of you are, are doing something with diet right now? Great. How many of you are doing GFCF? How many of you are doing some other diet? Okay, great, wonderful. So today I'm going to talk about, you may have heard of the various different diet options out there. I want to talk a little bit about them and give you a sense. Everybody seems to think, uh, oh, this diet worked for me. This is the best diet. And it can get a little confusing. And sometimes then parents don't know where to start. So I want to just give you some good underlying background on some of those diet options. But before we get there, I want to start just a little bit with the background and the biochemistry just to tie it all together, just to give you a sense of the science behind it all and how and why it can be helpful. And then go into some nutrition basics. So what are some basic things that you can learn and know about nutrition that can be helpful for your child on the spectrum as well as all of your family members? Talk about some nutrition boosters because I really feel that getting good nutrition in, not just doing a diet, is important. And so we can talk about that. And then specifically, how can you begin and evolve a diet that's going to be the most helpful for your child? So I'm sure all of you are already aware of some of the signs and symptoms of autism. But what some people aren't aware of are all of the physical symptoms that are so consistent among children with autism. Now, of course, every child is different, but there are some interesting similarities. And this is the key piece that we can really influence with diet. And when we work with the health and the physical symptoms, we then see kind of a cascade into many of the other areas of autism as well. There are a variety of underlying causes and contributors, both genetic causes and environmental causes. And so these are things that, by understanding them, they can help guide many different areas. Dr. Bradstreet talked a lot about some of these earlier in, in his talk. So just briefly a little bit, I, you may hear throughout your time with biomedical intervention, about different forms of biochem or different biochemical pathways. And so I just want to put this up here to show you how one or a couple simple pathways like we're showing here can make such an impact on so many different areas. Just looking at the methylation, transsulfuration, and sulfation pathways, you can see detoxification, immune function, inflammation, digestion, all sorts of areas being impacted. And so when we understand that, we can see how food might influence it or how supplementation might influence it. In this case, the green area, especially the glutathione, is a lot of the work of Dr. Jill James. And the orange box is some of the work of Dr. Rosemary Waring. And the orange box specifically will have to do with some of the substances we're going to talk about later, which are phenols and salicylates. And again, Dr. Bradstreet touched on these a little bit as well. So by seeing that these pathways may not be working optimally in a child with autism, you can see that we might want to change the foods that we feed a child to help support digestion, to reduce inflammation, to help with the processing of some of these phenols. So that's the part of the biochemistry I just wanted to kind of tie together how that, it influenced, how that influences diet and how diet influences that as well. So the gut, the GI system, the whole digestive tract, this is really in a key essential area. And you're going to hear about this over and over again in your path that you'll be on. 
And the reason it's so important in terms of diet is because food is the thing that has the impact with the gut continuously. So every time we eat, that food is going to come in contact with the gut. And so that food can either help support the digestive system or can cause an extra burden on the digestive system. And so we want to choose foods that are going to be a positive influence on this. The GI system is so important because the largest part of the immune system is found in the gut. 90% of the serotonin, which is actually a brain chemical, a neurotransmitter, is actually found in the gut. And all sorts of, uh, it's the barrier for bacteria and viruses and all sorts of things. So this system is really crucial. And of course, the main, one of the main things we think about is its ability to digest and absorb nutrients. And so here is one of the big reasons that we want to support good digestion, because we want to be able to break down those foods get access to those nutrients, the vitamins and minerals that will be important for all sorts of different enzyme functions, all of that biochemistry we talked about, we need all of the different nutrients to support that. And also we need to be able to extract the fatty acids for the brain, the amino acids, the building blocks for all the proteins. Those proteins help with neurotransmitters and all sorts of things. So the gut is really crucial. And over and over again in the talk today, you're going to hear about ways of supporting the digestive system through the foods that you eat. And the great news here is that since this food comes into contact with the gut, there is so much that you can do in terms of diet and nutrition for this. So this is a chart that's in my book, and I just want to show how this is a whole body disorder. So instead of thinking of autism as this kind of mysterious brain condition that sort of begins and ends in the brain, we can see that what happens in the body affects what happens to the brain later. So when you look at what might be happening in the body, you might have some of the biochemistry is a little bit imbalanced. Maybe because of a bit of a weakened immune system, you might get more antibiotics. And that can create a cascade of challenges, yeast overgrowth, gut inflammation, an inability to break down foods as you need to, maybe the creation of opiates. And this cycle can continue. The important thing I think here is that that whole body condition can directly affect the brain, which is what Dr. Martha Herbert describes as downstream from the body. So it's not this isolated island, but it's connected to and it is affected by all of this biochemistry. So if you have yeast overgrowth, that yeast can give off toxins. Think about yeast. When, how do you, when you drink beer, you have yeast and carbohydrates that give off basically alcohol and make you drunk. Something not too dissimilar happens when you have yeast overgrowth in your gut and it's feeding on certain sugars and complex carbohydrates. It can create an effect on the brain. When you have these biochemical pathways, the methylation and sulfation that might not be working ideally, you might get neurotransmitters that aren't quite imbalanced. When you have inflammation, that can lead to inflammation in the brain, which can directly affect the brain. You can have decreased detoxification, which of course, those toxins can affect the brain. You can have gut permeability, and that can affect your ability to absorb the nutrients that are so vital for the brain to function. And if you aren't able to break down your proteins and your foods well, it's possible that the wheat and dairy proteins can actually function like opiates and affect the brain. So you can see that when you see on